All right, everyone. Thank you uh, for tuning into this awesome opportunity we have to listen to my friend Ed Zadelman share some of his uh, experience and stories and wisdom about uh, building community through both his maybe his own experiences as well as uh, and building agreements with people. I think more than all, and he's helped a lot of people around the country and elsewhere in the world as a consultant, helping them get their invisible infrastructures dialed in and and ask themselves really also important questions before getting too far in their. Uh, preconceived notion of where they're going. So um, I'm sure some of that will come through too. Ed's a great guy and I'm going to pass the mic to him so he can tell you a little bit more about himself and what he's got to share today. Sweet, sweet. Thanks, Jason. Always a pleasure uh, being on with you and uh, yeah, and just sharing with people. Um, yeah, so on this topic of agreements, I'm excited uh, to share some nuggets that I've learned, um, not as an expert, uh, more as an observer. Uh, although, yeah, I have many years in this space, we're talking about a whole new frontier of humans living in community and different forms of community. And so uh, even understanding what agreements are like, how they're enforced, uh, the reality, even if you have an agreement and it's not met, what are you going to do? So this topic opens up a, a wonderful can of worms and not one that I would aim to try to figure out in one conference or one session, but to understand the context that we as a society are in a paradigm shift and people are trying to learn how to live together with the complex um, perception filters that occur because of our upbringings and different stories. So it's not going to be easy because it, it, it's person, person, and filter. And so it does take a good amount of inner work to even be able to discuss agreements in an eco-village. Um, so yeah, not to go too far ahead, we'll look at all different types of agreements and, and angles to this conversation. But um, my background, as you asked, Jason, uh, I came here 18 years ago to Costa Rica. My family came from uh, what is now known as Ukraine to the US and I was the first born in the US and the first to leave right after college. And um, for the same reasons my dad left the Soviet Union, he smelled something was changing and his life wasn't aligned with it. Um, and I wanted more in life. I was finishing a career in nightlife and a little stint in finance and it wasn't for me. I was not the smartest guy in the room in that business. Um, and I started going on retreats and really taking care of my health physically and spiritually um, and decided to take a leap of faith and after college moved to Costa Rica and start a family business, um, a community and retreat center. And with all the energy and with all the motivation and even some money um, and then saw how hard that quickly became. 2008 happened. Um, real estate became hard. The the on paper parts of building a community became really hard not the vision and the dream the the paying the banks mortgages and different stuff and um i had been embarked on a process of creating a 90 person community um in a retreat center or healing center and so we did get a chance to look at what kind of agreements um there are uh around in all sorts of communities, not just like the hippie stuff, but in like real HOAs in the US or wherever and what doesn't work and what works. And uh, I remember like long debates with uh, the team on certain things that I was like, no. Um, and yeah, I also had like a pleasure of experiencing when I moved to Costa Rica, I met a dear friend, Stephen Brooks, who some of you might know. Um, who was also the founder of Ecovia and Alegria uh, Eco Villages. And I went to his first HOA meetings of Ecovia. I went and I sat to see like how all these conscious people with uh, super aligned values, how they met so peacefully. And um, it wasn't so peaceful. You could ask Norman, Stephen's father, you know, the kind of things that these conscious people were throwing out at the HOA meeting um it was i mean yeah it was like watching a wrestling match uh i didn't i couldn't believe it um at the time 
And so, yeah, basically um, there were things that came up that, and why I want to bring them up, um, there were things that came up that no agreement could solve, okay? Um, and some of the things uh, that I asked actually at Envision Festival at a conference on, at a talk on community, Norman Brooks was in the office, uh, in the audience, and I was like, Norman, what is the number one problem in your community agreements and HOA structure that people butt heads about? He said, pets, pets, dogs, cats, neighbors, yard, this and that. And I was like, wow. And when I sat in on that HOA meeting, I saw that. I also saw things that I didn't know how they would be solved. One uh, gentleman um, was opposed to building a huge walled gate around the entire community. Um, uh, he didn't want to live in a prison. Although there was a, a woman in the community who really wanted that wall because her son kept going under the barbed wire, like the typical Costa Rican cow fence onto a public road. And in one sense, I feel empathy for this guy who's moving from Canada, doesn't want to live in what he calls a prison. And I also feel empathy for this woman who wants some modicum of safety for her child to be protected. And I realized there is no resolution to certain conflicts. And what I saw years to come was 30% of the people, maybe I'm wrong exactly on the, on the number, but some 30, 35% of the people ended up moving out who didn't like the agreements or the structure and other people moved in. And then now you go to Ecovia and yeah, I'm sure they have certain issues, but there's a good amount of homeostasis, like things have stabilized. The school is strong, food is being produced. People are mostly in agreement, but that's some years later. So Ed, um, yeah. I'd like to ask you, so in in their process, did they, are you saying that they they started off with less of these agreements and as they started getting going, they were like, wow, we need to tighten this up and and be more clear about things? Was that? Well, I don't know. I, I don't want to jump in onto the like internal of their agreements because I wasn't involved on like the inside of that. Um, I just meant from the perspective of even if their agreements didn't change, which maybe they they did a little bit, but mm -hmm. the people changed. So the initial wow. founding agreements, the initial HOA rules um, that you know in Costa Rica are stamped into condominium law. You know, those are the things that. Um, you know, for some people who don't even like that structure, and we'll get into that a little bit today. Um, you know, there are people who, like two of my friends who moved out and moved to Cherry Bow and they're happy. And another couple who moved into their house and is super happy with the agreements in place. Uh -huh. You know, they weren't because they they kept getting fined for their dog. And they're like, this is too much. Oh, um, so yeah, maybe I would... Um, I would actually like back up a little bit uh, before going too deep into the agreements conversation, maybe to set a little bit of foundation, if you're mm -hmm. cool with that. Please, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I really think that getting clear first on a vision and a, and a strategy for a project is really important when it comes to agreements, because um, agreements need structure. So if you're clear on expressing the vision for your community, community and healing center, co-living house, if you can express your vision clearly, um, it'll really help avoid confusion later with people who might have not understood what they're getting into, no matter what your project is for those who are listening. Um, and really getting clear between you and you of your vision and what agreements you want to be a part of. I don't like too many agreements, me personally. So I'm very careful what agreements I engage in. I have one for a community I'm a part of, like it's a whole contract and you sat in on that uh, community yeah. on Leap Forward. It's a very extensive agreement. It's a serious effing contract and it's for a community that we meet on Zoom and in person. And this agreement is of the highest level of integrity. Mm. We're not late to meetings. It's, it's not, unless an emergency happens or something you communicate, it's the highest level of integrity and it's not even for a physical community you know mm -hmm. so um you know they really spelled out in that example of leap forward and in, in projects that i've seen that are successful they really laid out their vision and their mission so clearly that you could see if it overlapped yours and so herein lies one of the biggest like points that i wanted to make 
if you're not clear on your values, like if you go to Burning Man, they put their 10 principles and maybe eight out of the 10 overlap with Ed Zadelman's principles of life. So I know with Burning Man, I can commute. I can go, there's nobody littering, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but that required me actually, when I went to Burning Man to make a list of what are my values. I'm not just gonna adopt Burning Man values. Uh, so really getting clear on whether it's yourself or your, or your project, your land project, what are my values? What is my vision? What is my why? All great journaling exercises. Um, this way, those can translate into agreements um, and people can see if they if they gel. Um, when back in the day, I think I said something like the language of community is values. Uh, and it is because if we're a bunch of communities um, in Costa Rica, in the world, we're part of, I'm sure, many of them, Facebook groups, whatever. Um, unless we maintain our own badge of values, we won't know how to commune with others and if they align and what to do if one of your values is crossed or one of your boundaries or agreements. Um, I actually had to witness that in a pretty large group mediation I was doing for a project and uh, someone said, well, we have agreements. They just weren't honored. What now? Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, okay, well, what now? So what now if your agreements, if your values, if something you stood for is an honored, man, what now is you either resolve it or you walk away? And most people aren't willing to do that, you know? Uh, so they get trampled at a company or in a community or in a project and they're constantly having their boundaries or values crossed and they don't speak up until it's too late. Um, so this is something that I think people don't talk about. A lot of times they'll talk about like, what are good community agreements and guidelines to avoid disputes around food and money allocated to school versus permaculture. But, um, you know, in Costa Rica specifically, if you have a community that's structured as a condo, as a condo association, which a lot of eco villages are like Ecovia and Alegria, um, those community agreements are actually printed up by a lawyer and signed. You know, mm -hmm. and if you break them, um, as an example, even in a simple community in San Jose, if you break the noise violation in a gated community in Escazú or anywhere, they actually have legal uh, precedent on how to remove you from the community. They kick you out, they buy back your lot at like market value or some formula. But um, the point is, those agreements are pretty easy to enforce, uh, they're by law. And so, it's not just getting a fine or something. You could eventually remove someone from a community. So you have, um, you know, you have laws in place. Not all, you know, not all communities go through the arduous process of uh, of condo regime. It means permits with Setena. Some people like it because they could enforce their rules. Other people don't because it's expensive, long, and sometimes restrictive. Um, so just to give people an example of what the counter of that is. In Nosara, one of the places where I work um, a lot, you know, they have neighborhoods uh, of, it looks like a community, it's houses and et cetera, but people bought uh, agricultural lots of an acre and a quarter, and 20 of those lots are together. And they have what's called an informal HOA. The neighbors essentially agree to, usually it's the most basic, like paying security guards and graveling the road once a year. It's not complicated stuff, but um, the informal HOA is very common. They all chip in on the roads, et cetera. Um, so in that structure, you really can't enforce anything. People have <laughs> their own independent ownership of an acre and a quarter next to other people. Um, so in that case, you might need more invisible structures between your group, you know, um, to make sure that projects like that work. They are simpler because you don't need all the permits in Tinamaste and Novita, all over people do just simple agricultural lot subdivisions. Uh, it's an easy way to work with a group of friends, but um, if there's no enforcement of the rules, you have to make sure that you guys or girls have your own structure of that. Um, I asked 
really simply, like in my community that I lived in once in Nosara, uh, does anyone not pay, you know, the 200 bucks a month, the fees? And, you know, the lady, one lady in the community said, yeah, there's this guy who doesn't pay. And I was like, well, what do you do? And they're like, nothing. The security guard doesn't walk by his house. We don't regravel his driveway. And it's all good. Like we, between the other 30 of us or whatever the group of people are, you know, we, we handle the security. So it ends up in a funny way, kind of working a lot in Costa Rica um, without everyone having to be perfect. Um, yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't know that it went so, but I guess they would have to, when you, when you're making those level of agreements, have to have something in there to, to be able to just remove someone. And uh, when the council isn't enough, you know, mm -hmm. and have tools of presencing, even if it's not some like super duper eco village, be able to actually have meetings and talk about issues before they erupt. Then you don't need, uh, you know, agreements are really important. So we're all on the same page, but um, also just having human to human integrated cooperation, conversation, resolution. Um, Especially, by the way, uh, I'm assuming also, you know, we're talking about this in, in the light of people building communities. I have a lot of friends who are looking at agreements also just for co-living. They all bought one piece of land together or all are in one house, you know, so yeah. it opened my eyes to a whole scope of agreement challenges. Uh, you know, I, I think we were at the same talk at Envision uh, on regenerative community, something or other. And uh one girl who runs a co-living co space in San Jose um, was just sharing some of like, like their challenges in our little subgroup around agreements, you know? So there are so many experts and people who have mined through experience problems that come up in the agreements. So we don't all have to start from scratch as if like, oh, we're, <laughs> you know, we're going to be the pioneers of this. Like there's been uh, people who have spent blood sweat and tears that we could learn from. You did a great job, Jason, uh, sharing agreements on your website in the past. I thought that was awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, such a simple step, and I don't mean that in a diminishing way, but actually quite the opposite. Like I've heard people at masterminds and things talk about agreements for so long and creating a network of resource sharing where we all post resources. Not one person posted their simple bylaws. That was my biggest question when I was working on a community. Like, mm -hmm. hey, buddy, I see like, you know, what your your agreements and bylaws are like. I just want to learn and see what I want mine like. Um, yeah, by you putting that up online, it's a huge first step. You could yeah. have a foundation, anyone listening or watching to a lot of people's probably countless hours of Brunching. Countless hours, every one of them. No, no, no one of those documents was written in a couple of days, you know, and that's, and the beauty of being able to, yeah, like, I, I'm really grateful for all the people, uh, Norman sharing what, what they've got their HOA document and, uh, yeah. you know, uh, Rancho Mastatal just shared a bunch of documents. They're prolific. They gave it all. Um, all kinds of little micro documents for this thing and that thing for the next, the different levels of involvement. So yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's really awesome that that's coming together and that people, once the place was somewhere to put it and they saw like, okay, well, people are putting it there like, oh yeah, we paid for it, but you're right. Let's just share. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we'll all have to pay for it anyway, eventually when we do our final versions, but let's share them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and what do you find, um, like in some of these discussions, like do people talk about enforcing agreements? Uh, that is actually part of what we'll be talking about tomorrow. That'll be cool. part of tomorrow's presentation. Today, we talked about pets a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. That's a big um, one. <laughs> but, but yeah, tomorrow we'll be, we'll be getting into that. And uh, hopefully I'll be able to bring more of what you're sharing into that tomorrow as well. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, there's a human part. I know there's a, you know, there's a left and right brain part to this. Um, there's actually getting the agreements down, right, of how resources are used and et cetera. And then there's the part of how these agreements are lived and internalized. Like, as an example, uh, I saw a truck in Costa Rica emitting a ton of pollution, right? Um and I said, don't we have crazy environmental laws about that? And my friend said, yeah, but they just pay the fines, like the big company, you know, right. they don't care. 
So yeah. it's better for them to fix the thing than to pay the fine. So I'm like, wow, cool. So we have these agreements that don't work on a country level. You know, uh, of course, there's dozens of examples like that. So, yeah, it is important to walk the walk. And I think that's the problem or that's uh, I don't want to call it a problem. That's the the murky water that I see people in our community movement navigating. Um, I have this like weird lens of view because I work on so many projects and communities around the country that I get to see like what are the, the rubs and the issues and the things that come up. Um, and yeah, when people start living their agreements and start trying to walk the walk, they see the reality, which is it's not exactly how it is on paper. Now what? And um, if the humans you enter into agreement into are not well vetted and they're not in alignment to you, I don't mean they're good or bad because that doesn't exist, but the people who you're going to be entering into an agreement with, um, that's the step that I would be very cautious about and take time with. Um, really discerning whether it's on a business level or on a community level. Um, I see people running into this problem all the time on a project level because they're so hungry to get funded that as soon as an investor appears, the agreement with the investor isn't always the best for them and, or the person is out of alignment, even if the agreement is good. And so really being able to discern your own center or your own north and what's in alignment for you and then seeing if somebody's a yes or a no, you know, and it's easy to see not that. It's easy to see the no options where like, man, something is off here. I don't care how ironclad this document is. I don't want to do business with this person. I don't trust them. And most people don't listen to that in your voice or they're in a time crunch. Um, so I think the biggest enemy of agreements and things is time. People rush into them. Right. right. Rush into them. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, rush into doing business with people, rush into living with people, cohabitating. This stuff is not easy. And nobody is humble enough to give it, in my opinion, the reverence that it should. You know, we're not just, oh, let's try to build a cool community yeah, then you could go to Florida and build a gated community with awesome permaculture. You'd be rocking if that's what right. you want to do, you know, from someone listening. Or you want to do co-housing, you could do that anywhere. But to actually forward the movement of alternative living and community living and regenerative living, conscious living, whatever words we put on it, um, that's going to involve people getting uncomfortable together, right. rubbing, you know, uh, you know, figuring out some solutions to things we didn't even talk about today. Mm -hmm. like, gosh, this was nowhere discussed in my learning. Great. Hope you come to the next CLA and share that with us. Um, so, yeah, I just want to also normalize this for people and, and humbleize it so we don't feel like we have to nail this uh, this week or this year. Like, this is a big mission we're all on together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's my opinion. <laughs> so the 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 reality may remains for some people is that they have they have a project uh there or they and they have land or they have something going on and they are actively they might have some people there they're looking for people to come in like the reality is that they're not going to sell go back somewhere else they're, that's their life and they want to make agreements with people and they want to uh, have. And one of the reasons that I'm encouraging people to write documents like this is because when, you know, investors do come, people that have some money that are like, hey, I, I want to support what you're doing and be part of it. And that's a pretty ordinary phenomenon right now that people buy into a project for, you know, a way to say it. And then in my in my experience, not having documents like this ready isn't a good presentation of your project to somebody who wants to take something seriously right so yeah. writing the agreements has its value in so much that it begins a conversation and like you said it's a living document you change it year to year um yeah. within that framework the the in in your, your you brought up the topic of essentially vetting the people that are vetting you like really um, paying attention to who you're making agreements with. If you're the person watching this because you've already got something and you're looking to make agreements with others, for instance, um, 
what advice would you bring? What, what, what are the things to look for, questions to ask, the things that you think are important in an agreement with somebody who's coming to, say, invest into your project and be part of it? That's a great question. Yeah. I mean, my first question is always to ask their why. And nothing to be ashamed of, by the way. Sometimes I meet people who made success in money and their why is like they want to fund a project you know, and they want to be the money guy or girl, you know, so I don't think anyone should be ashamed of what their why is and how it fits into the puzzle. But um, I always ask people, what's your why? Uh, I was looking at a project where someone asked me to get like further involved uh, than I normally do as an advisor and consultant. I was like, why are you doing this? Because I know my why and still I have to re-question my why every month when I'm like, oh, let's get deeper into my why. It's not just bridging people to alternative living. There's a specific why in there. But my point is, um, when I ask someone their why, I can quickly assess what kind of agreement this might be if I want to enter it. This person is really looking, their why is uh, totally for the cause of humanity and to enjoy a process. And so if I work with them, this is going to be either impactful or fun, maybe not profitable. Okay. And if their why is something profitable, that also, you know, is sustainable and et cetera. I'm like, okay, well, this person's thinking about money, you know, uh, they need sustainability maybe for personal reasons or investors. So um, yeah, just understanding what someone's why is, is a quick way to assess if I'm in a gel with that person. Um, uh, and sometimes, you know, yeah, I'll ask someone their background, but that doesn't really matter as much to me. It's more to to just know the person. But the reason um, why I like to get to know someone on a friend level, I do business really weird. Like I just become friends with people and see if we vibe. And if we do like for business reasons, I'm like, cool, we can establish common friendship. Like I would hang out with you. Probably like it would make it easier to work with you too. But not just some like cold person that I shake hands with. Um, but I feel people and I know this might sound hippie or intuitive, but I also know like non-hippie people who use their gut in business. So if you're super woo-woo or you're super deep uh, entrepreneur, yeah, using your gut to feel the person in front of you is the final frontier. Because if I can sense myself, if I can be sensible, if I can be sober, you know, and I don't mean just strictly sober, like drug sober, but sober, aware, awake, perceptive, not run down because I'm super tired building my eco village. So I'm making bad decisions on people, uh, you know, that I bring on agreements with team members that I bring on to my staff agreements with investors. If I'm not in the state of mind to really assess those agreements, because I'm overworked, um, it doesn't matter what I tell you, trust your gut, listen to the why, uh, you got to be present. And so that would be my only piece of advice when getting into an agreement and really being conscious of, uh, like I have a friend who systematically went and removed every agreement he had, except one between him and God. And I think him and his mama, so probably two. But, um, you know, he told me, and he's an extremist, so I don't want to use him as an example, like everyone should do that. But he said, Ed, it really showed me how many agreements I have and how simple life is without as many. There's ones that I can't avoid, like legal ones, my rent, but meaning the agreements that I get to choose willingly like to be a part of that are outside of the maybe standard agreements like in an apartment building. Um, those are ones that have very often brought, um, yeah, just brought some issues into his life and same with me. Uh, doesn't matter if it's a romantic partner, a business partner. Um, I'm very careful about any new agreement uh, and even doubting my perception of trusting my senses our perception is totally flawed based on the desire to survive physically and emotionally in society. So it, when I don't trust my gut on reading a person, I would ask somebody on my team, a couple of people. I love asking women. Uh, women have that amazing uh, spidey sense, you know, not to generalize, but yeah, divine feminine, you rock, you know, <laughs> and um yeah, and so I would ask, uh, be humble enough to know, uh, maybe I'm misreading this person. <laughs> I remember ex-girlfriends of mine like, oh my God, you're so blind. How do you not see, you know, that and that? And I'm like, oh, okay. 
That's cool. Yeah, I totally saw that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I really also think you can ask people for help um, that are close to you if you're having a hard time intuiting if a person is good to get into agreement with. Yeah. All right. Do you have anything else or would you like to open up, see if anyone else has any other questions? Yeah, I mean, I think we covered kind of uh, an array. I'm definitely open uh, for questions too, yeah. Anyone on the call have a question for Ed? Hey, how's it going? Hey, what's up? How are um, you? I'm well, I'm doing well. Um, so have you ever with these agreements so it sounded like you had developed agreements with um like an online community through zoom and and um and what were like some of the main what, what were some of the main agreements like other than confidentiality likely yeah yeah. And by the way, when I say online community, it's it's a physical community. We meet often online, uh, sometimes in person. But um, yeah, it's the strongest community that I have in my, like it is my primary community. It's the strongest one I've witnessed in terms of studying other communities. And so there is a values and agreement document that we all sign when we join Leap Forward. Um, at some point, we can ask uh, Jason if Ronit would be open to sharing that because it's a very open source organization. Obviously, it's um, not for land projects, but I think a lot of the things apply. Mm, to, uh, yeah. So I guess. Um, muted. Oh yeah, Jason's muted. Jason. Right? Oh yeah, no, I just said yeah. I agree. That would be that would be great if you think she'd be open to that. I would. Uh... I would definitely uh, invite that on the list there. I think a lot of people would get, she's a very thoughtful, everything that's produced is is uh, very mindful and thought provoking as well, which is a lot of what I talk about as we're doing the agreements. Um, as, as I get into day four of talking about agreements, I'm like, what the heck, man, maybe I'm, I'm over it already, like you're saying, but you know, I do understand the, the uh, I do know the inherent value of the work that we're doing. And I, and I continuously say it doesn't have to be any longer or shorter than you want it to be. But um, I would be thrilled to see what she's put together and have that as be as another perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, I will, um, answer some of Tara's questions now, like in terms of the types of agreements. Um, some of them are really uh, simple and they're based on integrity in terms of uh, things like time and uh, being on time, because if you are out of integrity in one thing, you're out of it in all things, you know? Um, so it's not just I was late to a meeting, then I was late to my condo association fee payment, then I was late to this or that. Um, so some of the agreements, like first the core values, which are uh, things like humility, um, caring for each other, really good conscious communication, um, the care for co-evolving together, like that's really a value of ours. Then I know that if we have issues, we're going to want to solve them because we want to evolve, you know. So some of those values like conscious communication and action means that we might, you know, butt heads and uh, ask for a nonviolent communication mediator, but we care about each other to work on conscious communication. So even if we don't have it, we'll study it, we'll learn it, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, and obviously integrated cooperation is a value, um, not just between the people in the community, but also in the case of Costa Rica, imagine the integrated cooperation with Ticos, you know, so we have an eco village and I'll get back to the leap forward document. But when we talk about things uh, like agreements, uh, if we're looking at integrated cooperation um, within a group of people who are signing a document, if they live in an ecosystem like Costa Rica, and there's also an external community of Costa Rican people that you're now in someone's home, what is your inter-community agreements? We can look at Ohancha in Nicoya as a great example of integrated cooperation in a Costa Rican community, you know, started by Costa Ricans. 
that has so much going for it and like no crime and cooperation and women in power and reforestation. And also there are foreigners there. There are a few people from Europe and all sorts of countries flew in, but we can do integrated cooperation when we integrate into our environment. So I don't want people to think that like some of these agreements that we're talking about are just insular within your community. Some of them like, you know, conscious communication and caring might be how you communicate your values to your Tico neighbors. You know, you're doing an ecstatic dance in a highly Catholic region. Uh, maybe they perceive something wrong. Like it's there's no problem here. It's just you're in someone else's country with a different culture. Maybe conscious communication within your community can also be out and into the greater community. Um, so that's what I mean also by living some of these values. They're not just like a checklist, you know, um, and integrity being one of the, the big ones. Um, integrity in all senses, which is if you're out of integrity, you're out. You're out, out, you know, it's there's no. Uh, I say like three strikes and you're out. Integrity is the biggest one, um, you know, so if we commit to something, I would rather someone not commit to something than commit and and not come through. And I, I learned that the hard way. I used to commit to everything because one of my things was people pleasing. And it was the worst because I would commit and not come through. And I didn't realize like how truly out of integrity that is. I told someone my word that I would be there or I would help with that. And I didn't. And I don't think I don't think we treat things as seriously around integrity as we could. And then a whole bunch of other things will go awry. Um, and yeah, and some of the other things like agreements and standards that you asked for specifically is um, uh, accountability is a big one in Leap Forward. Transparency, if you're feeling something like you talk about it, you don't bury it. So imagine that in a community agreement, if that was one of the agreements. And someone said, man, all month, you've been driving me freaking crazy with your dog. And you said, all month, why didn't you come to me the first night that you couldn't sleep? Like, be transparent. You don't have to tippy toe around these things. Uh, or like, oh, I didn't want to disrupt your meditative state of bliss. So I didn't tell you that I, you drive me effing crazy because we're a spiritual commune. You know, so transparency is a huge one. Um, you know, responsibility is another one. Um, you know, Burning Man, we had radical self-reliance. When I opened up my retreat center and community, like, nobody had responsibility for anything. Everyone was like, wanted to be waited on in community. And I'm like, community is co-created. They're like, oh, who's providing the guidelines? Who's providing the organic food? Like, as if like, we don't have the responsibility to do this together. Um, so not having to lean on somebody in a community and say, well, you're the founder. Why didn't you do this? You're a community member. Why didn't you bring this up? You know, so everyone has a responsibility. It's not just this, especially because we all talk about wanting to live in like circular economies and cool new forms of coexisting. Try getting off your butt and doing something, not just pointing at the guy or girl on top and saying, you know, Norman or Stephen, you could have done this or that or whoever the founders of these communities are. The people are responsible. One of them started a school. Great. Awesome. You know, off property. Like it's an amazing school, you know. Um, and yeah, the other ones are in forward are things like uh, authenticity, being really authentic, playfulness. Like not to forget that this is fun. This isn't like eco boot camp, you know? Um, so those are important things in our community that this is play, this is grow. Um, and um, yeah, and then we have uh, also an agreement on ecology and being ecocentric because uh, nature is important to us. Um, so and understanding the the main thing in Leap Forward is uh, also that human beings are part of nature. Nature isn't like a bunch of fruit trees on your property. Uh, we're nature. So I know it's a long-winded answer to your question, but I wanted to go through some of them with you. Yeah, just to give a sense. Um, yeah. So Ed, do you think uh, after reading these agreements before you came together with this community that reading these agreements and putting your 
intended signature on the line of saying, yes, I agree. Has that altered the way you show up in the community and maybe outside of it? Yeah, I'm laughing because it's like, oh, I get pushed to my limit. That's the whole point of this community in certain extents is we really stretch to our limits of care for each other and growth. And uh, I didn't expect like how rigidly enforced these agreements are energetically. There's no like punishment. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I didn't, first I didn't really understand. And now it's really enforced how I show up. Like I keep using the time example, but came to the first meeting with that group kind of late and made time in my schedule for them. And they were like, whoa, well, now we see who you are. And I was oh, like, oh, yeah, <laughs> wow. Yeah. And they're that's, like, that's yeah. powerful. It's like, oh, so now I show up on time all the time, every time. And if I can't, for some reason, I'll, I'll write a message, you know, but uh, yeah, it's definitely. And also in, in um, when I've been out of integrity, these things are used in a way as a check. Like, hey, like you wanted to participate fully and you agreed to be present if you were acting like a fool or doing something. And so sometimes you get some tough medicine, but you know that that's what you signed up for. And I'm like, oh yeah, I literally signed up for this. I signed up as a paper that you could tell me something that I might not want to hear. Yeah. Because you care. It's not like for some gain, you know, and that community doesn't have an economic aspect to it. So it keeps it really clean. You know, in land projects and other things, there's money involved, which creates a lot of schmutz, you know. Um, so agreements, when they come to money, have to do, yeah, they have to be very well thought out. And I think with that, it's it's got to be fair to say that considering that a vast majority of agreements that exist in the world are to have money in there somewhere as far as accountability and um and compensation and so forth and i think with all things you know it's got to be it, anything can be anything depending on its intention and the and the real design behind it but going saying like oh it has heart but where because it has money we're you know going to be less trustful of the agreement i don't think that's you know uh, I don't know. What do you think about that? Well, I just, by the way, one thing on the money part is if you're making an agreement about money, look at the exit before you enter. Look at the worst things that can happen. And any smart business person will tell you that even if they're signing a deal with their brother or sister. Okay, like, like what if things don't work out? And in our communities, uh, Jason and Tara, everyone's is apparently brothers and sisters. My brother, Ed, my sister, Tara, you know, so we're all this uh, conscious family. And I've seen so much weird stuff around money and loans and whatever. So no matter what you get into financially, just make the agreement as such that if it doesn't go the way you plan, things are clean, especially when friendships are involved. These are not, this isn't like Wall Street or Silicon Valley. A lot of these financial deals, even in creating a community, someone bought the land, their friends are buying the lots. So nobody wants to screw each other over mm -hmm. uh, and ruin friendships. That happens all the time. Mm -hmm. it's in the time or there's a loan somewhere involved. Uh, so I, I have a friend who's like, he has money and he could lend it to friends in projects and different things. And he's just like, Ed, this has burned me so much. Like I've lost friendships because I wanted to do a good deed and give money as a loan. And instead I created debt for the person in a horrible cycle and lost the friend. And so, yeah, when it comes to money, uh, the agreements have to be very well thought out, even to the point of like, my, you know, some of them might seem a little 3D than 5D or old world, um, but they exist for a reason. So Right. Well, that's that's my point exactly is like that's that's their where their value lies is that without the agreements it leaves room for i think more of the schmutziness like oh yeah we'll just do it like this and it'll be cool but when you really take the time to meditate on and go through the conversations and in a state of friendship say hey what 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 happens if something goes wrong 
What what right. what is the exit? Like, let's imagine like things change and like what is the best way to handle this? What are we agreeing on? And I'll tell you from my personal experience, you know, the when I left my farm, I had um agree we 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 did all the whole thing we had the shareholding agreements and we um we thought about them we ran them by other people it was all in there we said yes this is what i agree to and then when it was time for me to go the amount that i was able to say walk away with in, in exchange for my shares and someone else coming in to purchase them and make me feel like my investment was honored. Um, there was so much room in my mind at that time, especially since things were tense for me to say, Oh, but I'm my contribution would be worth way more than this and all the business. Right. And because in good faith, we made agreements and then time came to face that i had i i had nothing but to say this is what i agreed to i'm good i go and uh it made it so much cleaner like you're saying and it would have been way more difficult if we were still riding on a handshake and a a conversation we had 14 years ago you know yeah I love that. And by the way, that's the very last point you said was such an important nugget 14 years ago. The, the reason why some of these agreements are so important is because they happened so long ago and nobody remembers what they said. Mm -hmm. So just for a contract of doing business, what did we say? Like we're going to split 2020, you know, 80 or whatever. Sometimes like, like, yeah, big things are forgotten. So it's nice as a way to encapsulate and keep it clean, like you said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you on the it's it's good. There's there's so many different avenues and circumstances. And like you said, your friend shaved off. He started getting rid of all of his agreements. And, you know, like like all things, it's the sand mandala, right? Everything is for as long as it lasts. And yeah. yet for as long as it's lasts, and if it's in in the state of the Tao, in the moment, in the if if it was made in an essence of good faith to maintain good faith then that has been the intention that everyone's walking forward with and if things change and go their way then at least they had that foundation and like you said that that ability to go back and reflect and be like dang that's that's how we felt and that's what we wrote and yep. and okay and so yeah I, I feel I find a lot of value ultimately in some, like getting very specific in some cases. And in other cases, you just want to make some general statements signifying that we'll work that out when we get to it. But this is the, the basic idea. Mm -hmm. And like you said, uh, you know, these are growing and living agreements. So you could agree every year to review the agreements in case they have I'm to a be fan of that. Yeah, maybe things in the world change. It's not even a problem within your community, you know, mm -hmm. so to change something. So, uh, yeah, not to hold ourselves to like too hard of a standard, but yeah. Even and the transformative, like you said, like that the impact of some of the agreements that you made with your community, they, they just transformed how you show up. You're like, oh my God, I all of a sudden, thank you for planting that seed. Your time is every bit as valuable as mine. Yeah. I wasn't brought up to think that way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're brought up with our own. Uh, yeah. I wish people had more compassion, even myself, for that reality that we're brought up with so much perceptual inconsistencies because the country or the economic status or where we're from or how our childhood home was, where a lot of survival things have been imprinted in us, uh, needing to survive socially as a kid in school or as a kid out of school. So yeah, when all this plays in, you know, um, all these core things, it's hard to perceive uh, clearly. And so it's not that somebody in the community is bad and is against you. They likely have a perceptual block and some root fear that you're triggering. And they're also mm -hmm. reverse triggering you in something else. And so that's why I think um, a lot of personal development work, peeling work, whatever you call it, growth, 
it, people need to evolve to meet agreements. Uh, so we could write the most incredible set of agreements for how humans are today, which is not great, but we also need to evolve as humans to be able to cooperate better. Right. And the, to have that integrity, like I was describing of me being in the place of being like, you know, I'm not going to fight it. That's what I agreed to. Right. You know? And that, that, that's the extra layer of reduction of conflict is doing the inner work and encouraging all of the community to do the inner work so that when it comes time to face those kinds of moments, um, there's not the resistance, right? The struggle and, and all of that are less of it anyhow. Yeah. And I've seen it really clean, like you said, in business where, you know, the contract is such and the founder leaves the company and he doesn't have that big of a check to go away with, but that's what he agreed to, or that's what yeah. she agreed to. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's it. And it sucks, but it's clean, you know? <laughs> um, so yeah. yeah, I think this is a, a topic that one could broach in so many directions and case studies, um, but I'm really glad that you and others are talking about it. Thanks for joining the conversation, Ed. It's great having you on the call. It's always a pleasure chatting with you. Always, always. Yeah, and I always talk about this stuff in my newsletters. So for you and anyone listening, if you want more cool, fun things, I have a, a newsletter on my website that is okay. the way that I get out a ton of free info. So you yeah. bet. I'll uh, I'll definitely drop the the link in the in the description on the YouTube and in Facebook and all that, so everyone will be able to access you there. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I'm, yeah, I'm it is a great newsletter. You always got just the most amazing photos. My gosh, you're talented. And uh, you find yourself in some pretty cool places and circles. So it's fun to Thank follow you. your story. Mm -hmm. I think my newsletter now, I'm like, oh, forget all of the rest of the work. I just want to write newsletters. I like traveling mm -hmm. and taking photos and blogging. But uh, yeah, it'll be part of my creative expression ongoing. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm grateful for uh, every discussion I've joined with you, Jason. And to see Tara again. So, yeah, buddy. Yeah. Thanks for helping round out the conversation. Pleasure.